Welcome to a very special episode of the Star Wars Canon Timeline Podcast because... It's also an episode of the Lorehounds Podcast. <laughs> Since, of course, people want to acolyte coverage on the Lorehounds, but this is also the major series I'm using to kick off the Star Wars Canon Timeline Podcast, it made sense to combine the two. So this episode and all acolyte weekly breakdowns will be released on both feeds, plus the Lorehounds Star Wars feed. And hi, by the way, I'm Alicia. And I'm John. And today we're breaking down the first two episodes of the new Star Wars series, The Acolyte, the first live action Star Wars set outside the Skywalker saga, taking place in the High Republic era, 100 years before the prequel trilogy. Hey, future editor Alicia jumping in here for an update from the end of this episode, just to set expectations up front. After going on for over an hour about just the first episode... We decided that we should put the conversation on pause and give the second episode its very own podcast breakdown, which we will get out tomorrow. Community feedback and that separate trailer-based speculation section we're about to mention will be included in the episode two breakdown. Okay, back to your previously recorded recording. We'll be following the Star Wars Canon Timeline podcast spoiler rules, which means we might mention a character from later or vaguely reference a well-known event uh, just for those who know those stories already. But we promise not to spoil any of the twists and turns. I promise to try not to. <laughs> and don't worry, I'm editing, so I'll bleep him out if he does. <laughs> and um, we have also a couple of subscriber-only episodes planned this season where John and I will go deeper into how this unfolding story connects with events later in the timeline. We'll tell you more about that later. We also have a small separate section after our episode breakdowns to discuss speculation based on trailers. We're partitioning that off for those of you who like to avoid that information. And we'll warn you before we get into that. For this episode, we're releasing the episode on all feeds at the same time. Starting next week, subscribers will get early access about one day before episodes hit the public. This is also true for the Star Wars Canon Timeline podcast feed, which will follow the same schedule. I am setting up the Canon Padawan Supercast now, but I will include a link already in the show notes, as well as the usual Lorehounds link. And next week, I'll tell you a bit more about what's included in that Supercast. At the end of the episode, we'll also talk more about what's going on on the Lorehounds feed and the rest of the network this hot lore summer. Hot lore summer. Check the link tree in the notes for links to all, including our lively Discord, where we're deep in Acolyte discussion. And for the record, since we always note this on the Canon Timeline podcast, this conversation was recorded on June 6, 2024, and everything is accurate on that date to the best of our knowledge. So welcome, John. Uh, I'm excited to talk about the Acolyte. How about you? I'm excited, too. I'm, and I'm finally invited to the Star Wars Canon Timeline podcast feed. It's very exciting. I've gotten to listen to you and Dead Eye Jedi Bob mostly, uh, along with your other guests. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we've been planning this from the start, of course. Um, and this, yeah, this is because it's it's a good era to launch this podcast, of course, the Canon Timeline, mm -hmm. because it's like we're starting now with something new earlier on. Um, outside and we know that new is always before. better. Well, no, but I'm just kidding. I, I, I'm just kidding. I also like to drink some member berries from time to time. <laughs> and there's plenty in this, too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. How would you describe this uh, series overall? What would, would you say the premise is? Oh, that's tough. I would say a murder mystery that gets solved in the first episode, but also mm -hmm. has an underlying layer of mystery involving motivations yeah i guess instead of a who done it i'd call it a why done it that's a good way to put it i like that um it's a disney plus show of course like all star wars shows and the showrunner is leslie headland uh, we talked about her more in the acolyte preview episode if you want to listen to that in the canon timeline feed um john did you watch russian doll on netflix not at all i did not Okay, I recommend it. I think you would like it too. It's kind of like a dark and twisty sci-fi mystery. Sounds um, fun. I, I will wait until after Hot Lore Summer to watch it, but it sounds right. good. Yeah, there's two seasons out so far. And it's actually, there's a few characters uh, from that show in this, but not, not Natasha Leone, who's the star <laughs> of that one. Right. Okay. Fun. I do like Natasha Leone. Yeah, me too. 
Um, so The Acolytes will be, the first season anyway, will be eight episodes. So we're talking about the first two today because they dropped together. And then we're going to be uh, talking about each one weekly over the next six weeks. Um, so I'm going to barely acknowledge this, but just uh, the Rotten Tomato situation is that there's 94% currently from the critics, meaning 94% of the uh, reviews are, you know, leaning positive. And 41% from uh, quote unquote fans. But of course, this number is improving. It was worse before the episode launched when there were a lot of comments about like mm-hmm. women, wah, wah, wah. So not really going to get into that, but that's where things stand. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, they there's a lot of people who are upset that Star Wars doesn't look like it did in 1977 as far as the actors. Right. And I'm not with them. I, I think that every every performance in this has been great so far. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is about a whole wide galaxy. If you don't mm-hmm. use actors from all over our small world, how do, are you going to recreate the feeling of, you know, the vastness and diversity, especially in the High Republic, which is one of the most prosperous and diverse eras? Right. Right. I yeah. mean, there's aliens all over. Why? Yeah. Why wouldn't humans be all different, too? Suspend your disbelief, a oh weary traveler. I mean, what disbelief? It just reflects, <laughs> I know, I know. It just reflects <laughs> the real world, yeah. Um, so on the Lorehounds podcast, we use something called the Pukila scale, which is where we decide whether uh, how much more or less violent a show or movie is compared to the first season of Rings of Power. So what would be your Pukila ranking for this one, John? I think minus one. Really? It's okay. got it's got fights, but they're mm-hmm. not gory. Right. And it's mostly like this is definitely a show geared towards a YA audience, I would say. OK. And I so well, I, I yeah. don't think. Well, I you know, I think anybody can enjoy it. But I think as far as rating, this is really like a YA show. OK. OK. And okay. I don't mean that in a negative way. I think it's exciting. Yeah. I think it gives younger viewers sort of like eyes PG, to look through. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I, I think Marilyn could could do this. And she did, actually. So I don't yeah, know why right. I'm questioning that. <laughs> <laughs> and Marilyn being the first name of uh, we'll talk. We'll hear from her in the feedback section. Uh, the one we always call our favorite Tolkien scholar because she is. So, John, what's your hot take on these first two episodes? Spoiler free for now. We'll we'll let mm-hmm. everyone know. Uh, we're just going to Yeah, talk about the episodes first without spoilers for those who are still deciding whether or not to watch. And then we'll let Mm -hmm. everyone know when we're going to open the can of spoiler worms. Yeah, so the few days leading up to this, I had been excited for this series for a long time. But the few days leading up to this, I was thinking, okay, High Republic, not Mm -hmm. a lot of not a lot to latch on to. I've read a little bit of the High Republic books. Right. But uh, I haven't even finished one of them. That's why I said a little bit, not not a few. Um, would you read Light of the Jedi? I read part of Light of the Jedi. It didn't hook okay. me. And I'm almost okay. done with Convergence. I went to era okay. two first now. Because, okay, fair. Yeah. Yeah. Or That's phase two, I, I guess it's called. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, uh, and I'm liking that one a lot better. But even those are removed time timeline wise from the series, right? Because this is at the end. Mm-hmm. Those are sort of in the middle of the High Republic era. Yeah. And. So- this series is as distant from those books as it is from the prequel era. It's, right. It's right in between. Right. So, yeah, I was just like, yeah, I don't think uh, I don't I don't think I'm going to have anything to latch on to. I was worried that I wasn't going to feel drawn into the world right away. Like it was going to be a lot of like taking this information, which is, mm-hmm. I think, how I felt in Shogun episode one. It took okay. a lot for me to like take in the information in episode one. Only on rewatch that I get to really enjoy it. Mm hmm. But this, I was right in. I turn it on and I'm right in. I feel like they open it up really well. I feel like the best thing about this is that they immediately draw you into character motivations instead of making you focus on wonky lore. Right. You pick up the wonky lore on the way, mm-hmm. but they it's really there. do make yeah. the character arc central. Right. And that is the sign of a good storyteller. And so right. I'm really glad that they did that. The world looks great. I mean, Star Wars production is basically always 10 out of 10. And Mm -hmm. it lives up to it here. Looks great. Uh, I didn't recognize certain actors who were in alien makeup, which is fun. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm just I'm just so pleased with this. I, every every casting I mentioned before is right on point. Everyone feels right, uh, and the story is intriguing to the point where I almost wish it were a binge series. Even though I always say I don't want a binge series because I just want to know what happens. Right. No, it de- it definitely left me with intrigue, and I'm glad that we get these weeks in between to to pick it apart. But yeah, this will be a fun binge series. It'll be fun to go mm-hmm. back and re binge too. Yep. Um, yep. So How about this, you? this certain actor that you're talking about, I'm guessing that's Stephanie Keen. Yeah. 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 So do you know her from? Are you a His Dark Materials fan too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I well, I didn't watch season three, but I watched seasons one and two. I want to go back okay. and watch season. Oh three. yeah, you gotta watch season three. It wraps it up. <laughs> I did read the books too, so I know okay, what okay, I know what okay. happens. So you know what happens, yeah. Yeah, that's why I wasn't like itching for season three. I was like, all right, that'll be cool right. to get to when I get to it. Right. Yeah. It's minor spoiler. It's a tearjerker. <laughs> and uh, and Logan too. She was really good in right. Logan. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it was fun to see her. I did know in advance that she was going to be a Thelen hybrid, a human hybrid. So, um, but it was she was unrecognizable when I first saw pictures of mm-hmm. her character. But yeah. yeah, overall, I, I love I loved the first two episodes. It's it's dark and it's very Star Warsy, and there's lots of world building and layers of intrigue. And these are all like things that are hallmarks of things I like. So it was kind of mm-hmm. made for me in some ways. It feels like um, I'm glad that they there were some reveals going in that people generally expected, and I'm glad they got them all out of the way like right away, <laughs> basically in the first episode. Mm-hmm. I love how practical everything is, like the makeup and the sets. And uh, they filmed on location, especially in Madeira, but also a bit in Wales. It looks amazing. They, you know, Madeira is a very striking island. And yeah, they, the work they did in post production just made everything even more gorgeous. You, you know, the production design in general is uh, in top form. And I love the music. So the composer is called uh, Michael Abels, and he's best known for doing the scores of Jordan Peele movies. And it's definitely got that okay, like, cool. eerie vibe to it. Yeah, definitely. Now, now that you say that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And it, it adds to the mystery feeling. Right. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to say about the mystery part is, and I, I obviously no spoilers, Mm -hmm. But one of the best ways I've seen mystery done in recent years is Severance season one, where Mm -hmm. each episode or a couple episodes solves a mystery and presents two more. Right. And I think that this show is doing a similar thing. Right. Yeah. um, Leslie Headland said that it was like an onion and each episode would peel back a new layer. Well, we'll call it Shrek because ogres are like onions. (laughs) All right, shall we break open the spoiler bag and get into episode one? I would love to. All right, spoilers begin in three, two, one. Episode one is titled Lost Slash Found. So it looks like all the titles are going to be opposites. Like, so we've yeah, I got, like that a lot. Yeah, because it's I, it really it's a story about, we find out pretty much immediately, it's a story about two twin sisters, May and Osha. Um, which are obviously being made to represent yin and yang in real world terms or Bogan and Ashla in Star Wars terms. So, you know, this is going back to the concept we talked about, especially in the Old Republic episodes about this uh, seeking of balance. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what, what the, they're telling us the show is going to be about. Not that Osha is good and May is bad. I think it's going to be about the balance between them. Right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I think the things that, May does are bad, but we'll, we'll see. We'll I mean, see what from, goes on. From whose perspective, though, that's the thing is I think, well, I did know, I do know this is going to be about shifting perspective. So I wonder, we, we're we seeing things now we might see differently later in the in the season. Yep. Fair enough. So the writer and director of this episode is a showrunner, Leslie Headland. And uh, yeah, for this recap, we're going to recap a scene and then talk a bit about it. I'm going to combine a a couple scenes that, you know, are covering the same arc, even if they don't necessarily happen back to back in the show. Makes sense. We start with the opening crawl. And so opening crawls, this is, I I haven't mentioned it yet on the Canon Timeline podcast, but it's like a very important Star Wars thing that happens. We Mm -hmm. always care about the opening crawl. Um, it, it was basically something that George Lucas copied from Flash Gordon. 
always ends in four dots, except for Return to the Jedi, for reason people have been analyzing for years. <laughs> um, hmm. But this one wasn't actually a crawl. They just kind of, the words appeared on screen, which does make it easier to read. And they said, a hundred years before the rise of the Empire, it is a time of peace. The Jedi Order and the Galactic Republic have prospered for centuries without war. But in the dark corners of the galaxy, a powerful few learn to use the Force in secret. One of them, a lone assassin, risks discovery to seek revenge. Mm. So yeah, we get this hundred years before the rise of the Empire, although we were told in marketing materials it's hundred years before the Phantom Menace, which is an important distinction because one is 119 BBY before the Battle of Yavin and one is 132 BBY. Mm. Um, so this is important in terms of who is possibly busy on the Sith side of things. So that's true. Uh, I wonder if they're using Rise of the Empire to refer to the beginnings of corruption. Mm -hmm. You know, the the beginnings of the rise of power of a important few characters. Yeah. Yeah, I think because yeah, mm -hmm. I just don't know if we can I, I I feel like it makes more sense to be before the prequels. Right. I mean, it's before the prequels regardless, but it's like how long before the yeah, prequels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. I, I feel like yeah. it makes more sense to refer to Phantom Menace with that. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Um, yeah, so we're just going to assume and let, until told otherwise that it's 132 BBY, so 132 years before the original Star Wars movie is set. But and this time of peace doesn't mean nothing bad ever happens. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely check out the High Republic recap um, if you... Don't know what that what bad things have happened. I'm sure we'll get references as we go, but this is a golden age of the Jedi and of the Galactic Republic. What? So, John, you said you've been reading Cataclysm. Um, mm -hmm. What have you noticed about the High Republic that makes it feel different than what comes later? Uh, yeah, it's the Jedi are much more. I think someone said this in our Discord. They're much more of like a police force, right? They are. Mm. They are very clearly allied with the. Senate very clearly allied with the Republic and not this, you know, third party. Oh, we we just go with the wind and we serve the Republic, but not directly. And we don't meddle with politics like they are very political in a way that it seems it might be taboo later. Well, but then in the next stage, we see them acting as kind of the military. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't, yeah, I feel like they think that they are more independent, but when you see the way that they behave, that's not mm -hmm. true. Right. They are really an arm of the Republic. Right. But they would, and, they would be offended if you said that to them. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, one quote that stuck out to me that I read last night, actually, in Convergence mm -hmm. was that one of the Jedi, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name because it's a book, yeah. Gela Natal, so maybe it's okay. Gela Nat Natai. Uh, Natal, I, I think, is the last name, but yeah. Anyway, she's talking to a woman on uh, Arano, and she, the woman says, uh, you fight for peace? That's like going to the desert to get water. Mm. You know, and and uh, it really does challenge the whole Jedi way of thinking, right? Is Yeah. And and I can't, again, I can't spoil later. I want to discuss later, but is, is it, you know, we, we see in Dara... In the next scene, I don't want to mm -hmm. go too deep into that yet. We see her refuse to fight at first. Right. And so that does seem to be part of the Jedi code. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how well that serves her in the end. Right. Right. Yes. Well, of course. Yeah. So there are there are wars like there's that civil war that you were referencing. Um the, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, not a civil war, but a war between two planets uh, over the planet right, right. that ends up getting the planet of Jeddah involved. Uh, we talked about that in the High Republic breakdown. Um, but yeah, this is, I guess, with the, when they're saying centuries without war, they mean it's not like the great civil wars that the Jedi had with the Sith, basically. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's they have small, uh, they consider two planets fighting a small squabble, right? Because right. that's like. That's like a drop uh, in the bucket. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's not it's not allied forces, you know, several planets forming a coalition against other ones. That's that's a different thing. That's what they right. would consider a war. Right. Exactly. I guess I guess it's the Republic itself is not at war. And so there is no war. That's true. 
It's kind of like the America in Vietnam. But anyway. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a conflict. It's not a war. Right. Exactly. <laughs> we haven't which, declared war since 1941. <laughs> which is funny because the original Star Wars was in part based on the Vietnam conflict. Oh, yeah. And I mean, the prequel trilogy is certainly right. laced with Iraq War era criticisms. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then the question, of course, left by this uh, opening crawl is who are the few in the dark corners of the galaxy learning to use the force in secret? Um, so people immediately jump to Sith. You know, the showrunner herself has talked about what are the Sith doing in this time of secrecy, but also maybe witches. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering because I'm only just getting into this in the mm -hmm. High Republic books, but the this idea of the path of the right. hand. I don't know if they I don't know if they're extinct by now because I haven't finished the books. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well we talked about certain minor spoiler that we talked about in the um the over, High Republic overview is that the path kind of evolves, the path of the open hand kind of eventually evolves into a group called the Nihil, which are the main uh enemies of the of the first and third phases because again the phases oh, are really okay. are out of order chronologically. Okay. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely signs that there may be connections, especially we're going to talk about that spiral we see on May's forehead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, just because I, I was like, this doesn't feel like Sith to me. No weapon, things like that. Right. Uh, that just doesn't feel like the Sith to me. And I could be wrong, but it, it just feels like the Sith are just use whatever tools are available, mm -hmm. right? Just improvise. Right. Right. So for the Sith, we're in the era of the rule of two. And we have an idea of which two Sith uh, would be busy during this time. We'll talk about that at the very end of the episode. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about it in the preview episode. But, you know, the rule of two is really just about who is actually a Sith. And there are always exceptions. They always have other people working for them. Uh, the Sith often right. take on more than one apprentice just to force them to fight against each other. Um, I do think, though, based on May's behavior, she's trying to officially become an apprentice. And I think that's why she keeps trying to steal people's lightsabers. Mm -hmm. I think she wants to steal it and bleed it for herself. But if if she can't do it the right way, according to her master's rules, then it doesn't count. Right, she's right. So speaking of her first attempt stealing lightsabers, uh, we open with a young assassin who will come to know as May, played by Amandla Stenberg. Um, the bottom half of her face is covered in a black mask. She's seeking out a Jedi known as Master Indara, played by Carrie Ann Moss, in a remote Jedi outpost. Finding her chumming it up in a local cantina, May relentlessly pushes Indara to attack her, telling her they have unfinished business and starting a fight with the other patrons to force Indara to intervene. Their fighting clears the bar, and Indara uses her comm link to call for help. At one point, May's face is revealed, and Indara seems to recognize her. May eventually ends the fight by sending one of her daggers flying toward the barkeep, forcing Indara to break her concentration to stop the dagger with the force, giving May the chance to send her other dagger flying into Indara's heart. May threatens the bar owner, but leaves when she sees his child cowering behind him. So we're on a new yeah. planet called Ueda. But yeah, what do you, what did you think about this whole uh, fight scene? My biggest complaint is that we lost Carrie Ann Moss in the opening <laughs> scene because I, I mean, science fiction royal, you know what I mean? It's, right. she's just, I could watch her be a Jedi all day. I feel like she was born to be a Jedi. Mm -hmm. She, I mean, Trinity from the matrix is right. basically just a Jedi. <laughs> it's just, well, that it, was exactly Leslie Headland's thinking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And and I love that she only at the very end takes her lightsaber out. Like she she does do a lot of like it could have just been Trinity, honestly, most right. of the time. Great right. stuff. Great stuff. And I and I do like that they give us the weaknesses of both, right? I mm -hmm. mean, in Dara, you know, if that were a dark side user she would have just sat there and watched her terrorize the whole place and just ignored her. Right. Maybe walked out. Uh, but because the Jedi have this need to help people, that's something that, you know, we see a lot of dark side users, a lot of Sith and dark side users play on. Right. And they use that to break their concentration, to pull them into fights, etc. Then we also see that May has a soft spot for kids. Mm-hmm. 
and, and parents relationships with kids maybe yeah we we see her a few times it seems like whenever she wants help with something she pays a kid to help her right that makes sense yeah yeah, the fight choreo, people keep talking about, well, they're, so they're calling it Leslie Headland and the um, and the fight choreographers who are uh, Christopher Clark Cohen and Lu Jung Chan. They call it Force Foo. <laughs> boo. And, yeah, boo. People, why boo? Have a better name. <laughs> oh, I think it's cute. But people are talking kidding. about, you know, the fact they use wuxia, but um, it's actually just like... I have to say, uh, people who are, know a lot more about martial arts uh, love to break down the, all the different ways that they combine everything from mm -hmm. like fencing to uh, to you know karate to um, everything that you can think of, Krav Maga, uh, you know, medieval sword fighting. It's all finds its place in the choreography. So I can't claim to be an expert in fight choreography. I appreciate it when I see it. But if uh, more people have more detailed understanding and knowledge about that, please do write in. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that stuff. I just don't know enough about it. Right. I love that each character has their own style, though. And yeah, I would love to hear people who are more knowledgeable about this break this down. And you, you can I just say, you see this, this seems to be a lot more diverse of a fighting style layout. You know, right. you, you know, we talk about the diversity of the cast, but also I think the different Jedi here feel so much more distinct than Jedi later in the canon timeline. Right. And this is also because they are, uh, we visit in these first two episodes an outpost. And, you know, we, when we talked about young Jedi adventures, we saw an even further out outpost. And so the Jedi, they were more mm -hmm. spread out during this time. And, um, Whereas we see later in the timeline, uh, sorry, minor spoiler, but they're more concentrated just in Coruscant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just seems like they're more homogenized later. Yeah. And we get our first cantina scene of the show, which uh, for anyone who doesn't know, <laughs> can cantina scenes, which are like the bars of the Star Wars universe, are iconic. This one is Lomi Uski Noodle Shop. <laughs> <laughs> And we're also introduced to the comm link, which is just basically how characters communicate. Um, and you can also use it for just audio or also with visual, uh, with ho holograms. Did you get Princess Bride vibes from the way that May shows up and she says, we have unfinished business, attack me with all your strength, and then does her stance? That's funny. I didn't put that together, but it makes total sense when you point it out. That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> But it's May is so I have to say May is so earnest in this. Like I really I'm ready to feel for her when I hear her side of the story because she really looks like she's about to cry when she's, you know, um Indara stops the patrons in the bar from laughing at mm -hmm. her for challenging a master Jedi. And um and she's like, Attack me, Jedi and, and Indara says, Jedi do not attack unarmed. And she says, Yes, you do. So mm. you can just see there's so much emotion brewing up under that. I need to know. What does she mean? Yes, you do. What happened? <laughs> yeah, something happened on her mm -hmm. home planet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something suspicious. Also, this line, this attack me with all your strength, is one of the things that made me think not Sith. Because a Sith would have just done a sneak attack. Hmm. The or Sith do not maze. care about, like, honor with, yeah. you know. Well, I don't know. I don't. Again, like, even this whole idea of you have to kill without a weapon. You have to say, attack me with all your strength you know, give them a heads up. This all feels very rigid and not Sith-like. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we could be getting bamboozled by the mm -hmm. making it look like a Sith thing. That's absolutely The Sith are, are improvisational and they are very results-oriented, right? They are... Right. I don't think they care much about the methodology of the kill, just that yeah. it happens. Well, I think that, I mean, what is Sith like about this? And so we'll talk about the master she meets at the end of the episode later. But um, basically, he I'm saying he it could very well be a woman with a voice distorter. Um, he says that you, the Jedi are selling a dream and it's our job to undermine it. What we're trying to do is like to cut chinks in that in the armor of that dream, you know, expose the Jedi for the hypocrites that they are basically. And that is very much the idea of the rule of two is that you worm your way into the inside of the Jedi um, order and then, uh, and the Republic for that matter. And, you know, 
spread the rot from within so that mm. you can emerge stronger. Right. Right. Okay. I do. The one thing that makes me think it's maybe a Sith trial, like I said, is the fact she keeps going for the lightsabers, but then doesn't take it at the end. So it feels like she's trying to pass a trial. And then if she took, could take the lightsaber in the right way, then she could bleed it and have it be a hers. Mm. So she needs to complete the kill without a weapon to get the lightsaber. That this is my, this is what I'm thinking so far. But of course, this remains to be seen. Mm. Um, I, I do think it's interesting if the bar dude had died, though, if um, like she really banked on Indara stopping him. But if Indara had let the, the bar dude die, that actually would have been better for proving their point that the Jedi are more selfish than they seem. Right. Right. That's true. I do think, though, that Andara looks like she wanted to st stab May at one point with it when she got hold of one of her. Uh, yeah, wanted, yeah. And then dropped it. The Jedi definitely are in denial that they still have emotions. It's just mm -hmm. it's just part of it. Like, you know, in one way, it's sort of honorable to to be doing this, you know, life of chastity and and you know, lack of lack of attachments and and all this. But at the end of the day, you're still a person you're still a humanoid and you're going to have emotions and i right. think that's the one of the biggest weaknesses of the jedi is that they don't acknowledge that right yeah and this is exactly what we see may trying to goad the jedi she fights into doing you know and in, indara at one point she does pull out her um her lightsaber to deflect may's daggers to cut them apart basically and uh, mm. may teases her a jedi doesn't pull her weapon unless prepared to kill which seems to be something most people follow, except for Yord, who pulls out his weapon anytime he gets the opportunity. <laughs> Yord is just hanging saber all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. He loves it. Yeah, he's so glad he could finally got that knight title. <laughs> <laughs> the guy is, I, I think I called him a pick me on the Discord. Yes. Uh -huh. He's a pick me guy. But yeah, May's, May's cool. I love the daggers. I love seeing a force user with a weapon other than a lightsaber for once. Um, we see she has that spiral on her forehead. And I have to credit Padawan John on Twitter pointed out that it looks like a spiraling storm, which would link it back to the Nihil. And the Nihil, they use like storm. Hmm. Um, they use storm words basically for all their jargon. And uh, so the head of the Nihil is called the Eye. Um, high up people are tempests and then below that storm strike. So it could be marking, marking, uh, her rank in whatever the Nihil became at this point mm. in the timeline. So the Nihil are not allied with the Sith at all, right? Like they are totally distinct. I mean, yeah, the, they could be, but they are distinct groups. Okay. I All mean, right. so basically the the path of the open hand, I don't know if you got to this point in, in your books, but they it's are okay. basic, they're anti using the force, basically. And they're like, but oh. especially not the Jedi. So mm. they're not naturally going to ally with the Sith, but you could see some corrupted uh, interpretation where they're like, well, you know, the f friend or the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. You know I mean? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, they're not allowed to use the force, but these guys, they they're they're pretty chill. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, who knows? It's been now uh, since. So I think the book you're reading is set at like 300 something BBY. And now we're at 132 BBY. So mm -hmm. it's been a couple hundred years. A lot could have right. changed. Um, all right. All right. Switching to the other who we find out is a twin. So mm -hmm. elsewhere, out in the Corpsec region of space, a young woman who looks exactly like May, but with shorter hair, whose name we'll learn is Osha Anasea wakes up in her quarters on the Trade Federation cargo ship where she works under the table as a mechanic or mechnic. With Pip, her pocket-sized repair droid, always by her side, she goes to work repairing a shield generator, getting temporarily distracted by a fire that breaks out, triggering memories of her and her sister May being separated from their parents as children. As she puts out the fire, a Jedi starship arrives, and her colleague asks her if those are her friends. So, yeah, I wonder, her colleague... I was, I was surprised that her colleague knows that she used to be in the Jedi Order. I wonder if she tells everyone or if that was like a, a drunken night on uh, mm. he references Nar Shada, which is a moon in the Nalhata system, you know, where the, the huts, the slug like people like Jabba live. Um, so it's a big crime moon and party moon. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering. The huts do like their parties. 
I yeah. gotta say. They love I'm, it. I'm wondering if some drunk night there, she told him her backstory, because it seems like that's not something you just spill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's strange because, no, no, I can't go later in the timeline. But, yeah. you know, you, we see that people who perhaps are not part of the order at other times keep it secret because it's a really unusual thing for someone to join and leave. Right. Right. It's kind of stigmatizing. Then people mm-hmm. want to know, like, why and what happened and what does right. that mean about you? Yeah. Right. It's almost like, you know, there there's some stigma sometimes with like discharges, untimely discharges right. from the military. Right. Uh, even though it can happen for completely legitimate reasons. And so a lot of people will just not not discuss it, basically. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I don't know if we're going to see her fellow mech neck again named Philip, but uh, that's his name, just in case you wanted to know. <laughs> but this this whole exchange where he so he says to her that they went out for an, an evening on Narshada and apparently she did not go that night, though she talks another time about drunken nights out with her colleagues. So mm-hmm. I do have to question, why didn't she go that night? This makes it sound like she's a homebody, which is later contrasted by what she says. Uh, but more importantly, this is this is why she doesn't have an alibi during Indara's murder. Mm-hmm. Although if she were on Nar Shada, wouldn't it have been easier for her to catch a ship somewhere else? Well, I bet if she's surrounded by her colleagues. Yeah, then... yeah, yeah. That's true. I but just wonder saying, how much. I swear I was in my room. Yeah. Yeah. I just wonder how much credence the Jedi are going to give to the words of a bunch of mech necks, people who are true. outlaws already. Right. True. But she doesn't even have that in this case. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I love the cranky Trade Federation people. They're just like, oh, god damn it. The the uh the Jedi are here and now we gotta worry about violations of yeah. law and yeah, these compliance people are awful. Yeah, they're always they always seem afraid of Jedi, like especially more than other people. Um you can tell mm-hmm. that's that's how you know that so we talked about the Trade Federation and Nemoidians in uh at the High Republic breakdown for anyone who's curious, but those are like the noseless people we see mm-hmm. on the ship. Um and yeah, they they're always kind of squirrely. <laughs> yeah, they are. They've always got something going on. Yeah, and um so Mechnek, by the way, new word. It's uh, I guess it's late High Republic slang. Um, and we learn that no humans are supposed to be doing external repairs. So I, maybe this explains some choices made about droids, droids doing repairs in later films. Uh, but this means, mm. indeed, OSHA is technically an outlaw. Um, and the Nemoidians, they kind of, because they're hiring outlaws, they can be a bit more careless. So at one point, OSHA overhears them saying, mechanics are disposable, but cargo is not. And OSHA's like mm. really good natured about it. She's like, we can hear you. <laughs> we can hear you talking about us dying. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. And it, doesn't she say something like, well, I'm not disposable, but he might be. Right, exactly. <laughs> so this is this is good character building, but it does also make me wonder if any of this is, I don't know. I I'm, I have to warn you in advance, I'm suspicious of every character in this show right now. <laughs> except oh, for fair Saul. enough, yeah. yeah. Except for Saul. Saul is pure, Saul is light. That's why he's named after the sun. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm loving Saul. I mean, I, I, I didn't think they'd be able to sell me on a Jedi as much as they do in the original and prequel trilogies. But already in episode one, I was in. And then by the end of episode two, I was like, this guy's one of my favorites now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, his facial expressions. We'll talk about some in particular. Mm-hmm. But... Mm-hmm. Now I want to watch Squid Game just to see him in something else. Oh, he's. Oh, you haven't seen Squid Games? It's so good. I have not. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, I definitely recommend it. And yeah, he's very good, but it's just uh, in general, it's a very good show. That is definitely has a high peculiar rating. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So we find out, yeah. So May's in Corp Sec, which is the corporate sector, which is an area of space, which we get the earliest mention we've had previously in the timeline is in the Rogue One novelization, which is basically like year zero. So, um, and it's explored later in the timeline. So this is the earliest that we've seen it. Makes sense that the Trade Federation is there because they'll be associated with this later in time. Oh, yeah. And I love seeing the Nemoidians, by the way, that their fashion choices are just mwah. They're just like, give me Christopher Columbus, <laughs> but make it haute yeah. couture. Make it fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I like that they, they seem to have, um, they got some flack for the accents in the original movie being mm-hmm. kind of caricaturish, and they seem to have toned that down, and it feels more natural now, just like normal, Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's right. Speaking. 
Yeah. And they, they, I think they even toned it down a little bit in the Clone Wars. Like they had already taken that right. into consideration. Right. Apparently they get to be more parodies of themselves as time goes on. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I mean, don't they all? I mean, I feel like every time we get a new character, like Yoda just keeps being more ridiculous. Right. <laughs> as he goes on. Right. Yeah. He's getting dotty in its old age. That's how I interpret <laughs> it. Um, Fair enough. But it's, I have to note that they say the Nomoidians, so they want, they want uh, the Mechnex to repair their shields, but uh, OSHA points out they don't usually use shields, and now they suddenly want to. So I'm paying attention to that. Like, why are they suddenly on higher alert? Something That's a good going. question, yeah. yeah. Do you think um, the way that, the way OSHA reacted to fire, was that giving you vibes like the Hound? From Game of Thrones with a family inspired fear of fire. Yeah, I, I think it's just it feels like a trauma response, right? But she's mm -hmm. just thrown back into this horrible situation that she went through. She's having PTSD flashbacks. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have a feeling that that's going to play out in some key moment where there's going to be a fire and she has to cope with it or or let it derail her. Mm -hmm. She's going to have to like walk through something. Yeah, right. Had yep. to be fire. Had to be snakes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is Lucas Films. Um, and I just have to shout out, by the way, also in this scene, that there is a proto-gonk droid. So gonk droids are a proud Star Wars tradition. They look like trash cans on legs, and they're basically like walking batteries, technically called GNK series power droids, mm. um, but called gonk droids because of the sounds they make. <laughs> okay. All right. Can you... Uh, you can't give me an example of one later. So anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, there's a prominent one in Rebels. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Nice. And we'll pick back up with that Jedi ship that showed up right after a quick break. Uh, okay, the Jedi rivals turn out to be Osha's former Padawan friend, Yord Fandar, played by Charlie Barnett, and his Padawan, Ta Tasi Loa, uh, played by Thara, Sh I'm going to say Shun, Shun. And they're looking for Osha. The Nemoidians cave quickly, admitting to employing mechnics and direct the Jedi to Osha's quarters. Osha's happy to see Yord, but he has to suppress any of his own smiles to inform Osha that she's a murder suspect. Osha says she was in her quarters at the time of Indara's murder, but that's not enough of an alibi. And they see the fact that Indara advised the Jedi to end Osha's training as a potential motive. Osha insists she's not only innocent, but it was her own difficult decision to leave the Order. But once the barkeep shows up to ID her, Yord feels he has no choice but to arrest her. Do you think that Yord uses hairspray or the force to keep his hair at that angle constantly? <laughs> I mean, the fact that it took him so long to go through his trials makes me question how how uh, good his con mastery of the force is. <laughs> okay, so we're on the hairspray train for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, have to shout out the, I love the fact that there's now a hashtag going around called Yord Hoard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's handsome. He just... yeah. He just uh, is very sus, I think. I mean, he's so, constantly being like, I don't trust Osha. I don't trust her. I don't trust her. And to me, that feels a little bit like projection. Yeah. Do you get, though, um, Galad from the Wheel of Time vibes from him? Ooh, I hadn't considered that. Because Galad, for anyone who doesn't know, Galad is a character. He'll show up in season three of the TV show. He's basically, he's uh, known for being hot and following the rules. Those are his things. Mm -hmm. Like to a fault, he will follow yes. the rules. He would, right. he would rather, you know, throw his sister or brother under the bus than break a rule. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I maybe, maybe. I just don't know enough about him so far. Right now, I've only seen him throw shade. And I wonder if... It's to a personal end, or if it is, like you say, just like hall monitor vibes. I mean, it does also feel like he's very, like he feels like he has a lot to prove, especially when, you know, Osha says to him, like, oh, you finally got it. He's like, I made night two years ago, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, and if, I have to point out that the actor who plays Yord, he's in his late 30s. I don't know if the character is supposed to be the same age, but that 
is pretty old to become a Jedi Knight. Compared yeah, to it other. is. It is. It's not young, wow. at least. Yeah, I mean, it's like, wow, well, man, ah, you gotta yeah. mark that one. Oh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, you can say, yeah, we see lots of, we see lots of, uh, as you were saying, we see lots of Jedi later who are much younger. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. And even before this, we saw, of course, Vanessa Rowe, who we'll meet in this episode. She was the youngest to become a Jedi Knight at 16. So that's an exception, but. Right, the, right. But but if that's the beginning of the spectrum, then I think right. the order is falling towards the end. Yeah, agreed. Um, and now, can I ask you, Jedi, mm -hmm. uh, are, are, is there a limit to how many knights they have they can have or masters or is it just whatever you get to that rank? Um, I, at this point in the timeline, actually, like a hundred years before this, they ended up pressing a lot of people into Padawans into becoming Jedi more quickly just so they could fight the Nihil. Um, but at this point, we see they do seem to be being more selective again. Uh, but I don't think it's not about mm -hmm. a, a certain quota because at this point they had more space to expand too. I think it was just okay. about when you're ready. Interesting. Although, of Interesting. course, yeah, there will be the certain number of members on the council. And there's like three Grandmaster Jedi at this point in time, I believe. Okay. Including Is one Yoda. of them green? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've already met Yoda in Young Jedi Adventures. We can talk yep. about him. Um, we we love it. I, I, I want to watch Young Jedi Adventures with my kids, but I tried to put it on once and they were like, what's this? Give me a Mickey Mouse. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were saying that your daughter preferred the Bad Batch, which is a much darker tone. Yeah. Well, I think Clone Wars, what she really liked is uh, oh, Clone Wars. because okay. she likes the intro music. Right. She like she like pretends to play the drums along with it. Right. No, that makes sense. <laughs> so we see Yord with it. He has a yellow lightsaber, which we're seeing pop up more and more. But they were originally um, they were associated with like sentinels or, or mm -hmm. temple guards. So this is means kind of a more guardian role. That's what I'm interpreting now until told otherwise. Mm hmm. I think he seems sincere when he says to her, I never thought I would see you again. He seems really sad about it. And I'm right. wondering what kind of complexity lurks in that sadness. Yeah. And I also want to say regarding lightsaber colors, it does feel like another part of the homogenization of the Jedi. Right. That so, later we don't see a lot of this color. Right. It's just blue and green, basically. Or red. If you're right. Yeah. But but you could tell there's a little something, something between them, right? Like they they bonded at least right. as friends, maybe as something more. Right. Yeah. She seems genuinely bubbly to see him and he seems like he wants to be, but feels like he can't. Yeah. And she seems excited to see him in a way that nobody else is. Right. Like everyone that's else true. seems exasperated with. Him. That's true. Oh, and that's that's such a shame. Then he's kind of like shitty to her. This whole <laughs> this whole is, like yeah. two episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's why everyone's exasperated with him is that every time they try to open up to him, he shuts them down. Yeah. So, by the way, his um, his Padawan, Tassi Loa, she's called a Zygarian, which are cat people, <laughs> cat people. Um, <laughs> I, I love that they did practical makeup on her. Uh, but yeah, yeah, the Zygarians are we do see them later in, in like the Clone Wars and other places. Uh, but and also they are like part of the lore going back to the Old Republic, where they were known as uh, powerful slave traders. And Yikes. Yeah, they fought the Jedi in the Galactic Republic, saw them as enemies, and they did, uh, during the High Republic, they were trading with the Nile. So, mm. so it's unusual in a way that... Naughty, naughty. We have a Zygarian Jedi, or Jedi to be at least, Padawan. Mm, I wonder if that will come into the plot line, or if they're just like, hey, look, member very. Yeah, well, it could be just like, you know, that uh, Headland's like, I, I like Zygarians, here we go. <laughs> Yeah, she definitely yep. is open about that with some species, um, but or it could end up playing into the plot in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, we haven't mentioned on this podcast yet before also that the Padawans, you might notice Padawans have braids. If they're from a species that doesn't have hair, they'll have like a strand of beads going down. It's just basically signifies their Padawan. And I suppose there's uh, some deeper meaning to how the braid is done uh, about rank and things like that. Mm. But uh, I can't tell you the details about that if they exist yet i think that might need to be defined more right um so yeah but having tassie there it's a good reason for exposition although even osha gets annoyed with your she's like you already know all this but we learned that osha 
left the order. OSHA left the order six years ago, uh, which I think is something we need to keep in mind when we're trying to piece together timelines later. Um, and she had been there since she was taken from this disaster in her home world, we'll be learning about, when she was the age of eight. And we learn from uh, Tassi that there were doubts about taking her into the order because she was eight years old, which just for to clarify for anyone who doesn't know, that means they thought she was too old, not too young, too old. Right, right, right. Which, again, uh, it's really questionable because it is in part because of indoctrination, right? Will we be right, able exactly. to teach you? to let go of all your preconceptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. If, to quote Bo Burnham, it's problematic. <laughs> yeah. Also, the other reason is because there were concerns about the fact that she seems to have not been able to fully let go, or even maybe it seems like partially let go of this traumatizing event from her childhood. Mm -hmm. But should she have to let go of it? You know, I mean, certainly it would help her deal with trauma if she could let go a little bit, but... That's part of her, right? That's one of her formative experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we get a quite a few times in these two episodes, it's brought up about the how Jedi are not supposed to form attachments because uh, they lead to clinging and fear, which is, you know, very Buddhist, actually. Um, mm -hmm. But also on the other hand, as Saul puts it later, Saul being the Jedi who uh, took in Osha, uh, who saved her when she was a child. Um, he says that, you know, it's some, it's good to remember the past because that's how you learn from it. So it's this duality I think we're going to be exploring in this also as well. Right. I really like how Soul brings that up because it it makes it feel... And I also like, and, and I know this is in, is in the next scene, but I'll comment on it mm -hmm. now. When, when the one girl sees fire, when the right. one uh, youngling sees fire uh, in the force, he says, yeah, that's there too. It's right. all about balance. And I really like this guy. He is so he's so willing to look at the dark side of the force and acknowledge its existence to avoid using it. And yeah. that's something that I think other Jedi lack, even in this era. I think that uh, other Jedi are more fearful of it. And even fear of the dark side can lead to the dark side. Right. Yeah. Um. So Soul, played by Lee Jung Jae, uh, he says that he, uh, so the actor says that he modeled Soul after Kwai Gong Jin, who's a character who pops up later. And you can definitely see that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted more Kwai Gong, so I'm glad we have this guy. Yeah. Um, he learned English just for this part. So basically, Leslie Headland saw him in, in Squid Games and she's like, I need you in my show. And he was like, I want to be in Star Wars. And so he learned English to do this. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. Mm hmm. Yeah. He does quite a good job, too. He does. I, w I wouldn't have known that he's such a new English speaker. Right. Yeah. I love, though, this the way he frames it as like, you know, the fact that you have to, the force is something it's something powerful and it's something you have to respect. Um, it reminds me of, you know, when my dad would always say when we would go to the ocean as a kid, he's like, always keep one eye on the ocean. You have to respect it. Mm. Do you think, though, do you see, so the way Saul talks about the, he wants the younglings to think of the force as an ocean and uh, basically give themselves over to it versus the Sith that are all about seizing the force. Doesn't that feel, not to bring up Wheel of Time a second time this episode, but doesn't that feel kind of like the distinction between the two types of channeling, mm -hmm. Wheel of Time, side R and side in? Yeah, yeah. Bend it to your will or submit to it. Yeah. Right. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it's about that duality, I guess, again. Mm hmm And by the way, I just have to shout out for High Republic fans that uh, there's a character, Elzar Man, who likes to talk about the Force as an ocean, who lived about 100 years before this. So could be that he, that Saul was taught in his line or something like that. Um, nice. so, so just to set up the scene that we've been teasing about. So Master Soul, he's teaching younglings to meditate at the main Jedi temple on the capital city planet of Coruscant when he is interrupted by an even more revered Jedi master, Vernestra Rowe, played by Rebecca Henderson. She informs him of his former Padawan Osha's arrest for Indara's murder, and Soul reluctantly agrees to help her investigate this matter, though Rowe seems to have already made up her mind about Osha's guilt. Soul harbors clear doubts. So, yeah, it, it, listen to the Acolyte preview for if you want Fenestra's full backstory. But um, she's basically she's more than 100 years old at this point in the timeline. 
She's the one that I said has been a Jedi master since age 15. She was, uh, you know, the youngest. So she's was seen as a prodigy. And a lot of book readers are like, what the fuck happened to her personality? She's now mm. suddenly seems like Ms. Bureaucracy. Um, we know from the books a hundred years ago, we already know she went through a lot, lost a lot of people, uh, had to go. And is to, this, is this phase one and three? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she, yeah, she, uh, ended up leaving. She ended up becoming what's called a way seeker, which is not officially leaving the Jedi order, but kind of taking a leave of absence to like find herself. So we know that she was kind of a more independent thinker before, but now it seems like she's officially submitted to I am the Jedi Order, you know, mm. must maintain control. Yeah, and, and she does this thing that the Jedi like to do sometimes, which is rather than confront the darkness within the Order, deny it and right. try to sweep it under the rug. Exactly. Which, yeah, I, I can see why. Um, so apparently, Leslie Headland, this is the only real cr big crossover character for this season. She says if there's a season two, there will be more. Um, but I, I mm. can see why she says she chose this character because just to show that contrast, that contrast between the idealism of youth and what you can be morphed into once you become part of the power structure. Okay, I'm into that. I like that. Um, yeah, we, we all become bureaucrats eventually, don't we? Yes. <laughs> and I know, you know, um, some people are lamenting that her purple hair is gone. She had long purple hair when she was younger and now it's been shaved or it's gone at least. And she now has the, uh, she's a Morallin, which a uh, later character, Barris Offie is also a Morallin, but mm. they are known for having these little um, diamond, black diamond tattoos that mark life events. And we now see a bunch of them on her scalp. So I think we're, we'll probably get the story of what those mean and you know what happened <laughs> yeah i hope we see more of this character i think she's she's an interesting concept to explore especially now that i know that she is very different from her book youth right yeah yeah it'll be interesting to experience her in reverse for you i think reverse reverse <laughs> um do you think that soul is overly attached to osha it does seem like he has a different relationship with her than he does with other Padawans, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems like he knows. I mean, he remembered her sister's name. Right. Which feels deeper. Well, that's probably, yeah, it was probably a memorable event. Yeah, that and, and I guess he was stationed there. So he probably mm -hmm. knew the locals before this whole thing happened. Yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, he certainly is like, no, I have to go. I have to go. Uh, which reminds me a lot of people later of, no, I have to go confront the person that I trained. Yeah. Yeah, I do also notice, as you're saying, you know, about uh, Vernestra sweeping stuff under the rug. She's always asking Sol to keep things secret. And I feel like on his own, he would not. I agree with that. Sol is very transparent. I mean, I could see other Jedi that we've met, you know, saying, well... Okay, maybe your sister's alive, but we got to keep this under wraps because otherwise I'm going to be ordered to bring you back. So let's not even say that I found you. Let's go figure this out before we go report back to the Jedi Order. But no, he calls the Jedi right away and says, hey, her sister's probably alive. And this allows people to talk, right? This allows her to go, oh, yeah, if you have her and there's another attack elsewhere, so she couldn't have done that. Let's right. go all solve this together. And that's how we avoid the comedy of errors. That is House of the Dragon. <laughs> How so? What do you mean? Because House of the Dragon, like most of the conflicts are based off of people not talking to each other. Oh, clearly. right. Yeah, yeah. No, I always say clear communication. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and these Jedi actually are pretty clear in their communication to each other, maybe not to the public. Right. Yeah. And by the way, I love the establishing shot of this scene where they show the exterior shot of the Jedi Temple. And we see that the city of Coruscant has not yet reached up to the temple's level. So when we see it later in the timeline, 100 years later... We see that the temples, even with the top levels of Coruscant, so, but a hundred years before that, now it's still a couple uh, levels below. So the temple is literally over everything else in the city. You know, you see the, you know, the people who uh, buy apartments in New York City and then they build a building right in the view of the sun. Mm hmm. 
they get cranky. Imagine buying a top level primo real estate apartment in on Coruscant. Yeah. <laughs> and then you and then on they're top like, of... they're going to build a level right on top of you. Yeah. I guess that's been happening for millennia. <laughs> yep. Yep. That just stinks. You know what else stinks? Being stuck on a prison ship. Yep. Yep. So we have Osha in her cell on a prison transfer ship manned only by droids. And Osha is surrounded by hardened criminals, one who is being kept incapacitated by a small starfish-like creature over his face, and the others plot to out overpower the droids running the ship and get free. When Osha declines to join the rebellion, they leave her behind after critically damaging the ship, sending it hurtling down toward the surface of a snowy planet. Osha gets out of her cell with the help of Pip, her droid, and starts to run to the last escape pod, but then remembers the subdued prisoner. She helps him get free, and he thanks her by knocking her out of the way and stealing the escape pod, leaving Osha mm. to die. She straps in and lands in one piece, though the ship is now rebel, and Osha wakes up to a shadow running away from the wreckage of the ship, and she follows the figure out into the snow where she experiences visions of her sister as a child and the fire that separated them. Osha confronts this vision, and May admits to killing Indara in the vision and says she will kill them all. Then Osha wakes up, back in the prison ship wreckage. So hmm. I don't remember too many unmanned prison ships in the Clone Wars. Uh, uh, is this why? <laughs> maybe, maybe this is the incident that made them go, we, we got to beef up security here. Yeah. I mean, this would do it, right? Yeah. I just can't imagine. I mean, maybe if it's a time of peace, maybe the Jedi have just gotten really lax at this point. Yeah. I think that that is definitely part of the case. Yeah. I love, though, they have introduced like some world building elements like they have these pilot droids that turn into chairs. That's really mm -hmm. cool. Um, they have these new the Dibuk, which are the, the parasite, quote unquote, a parasite used to subdue violent criminals. It does weird stuff to your brain. <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering, what is that weird stuff? Because they're like, he's having a great time. Don't yeah, worry he, about him. He's like tripping. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then I love when she she shocks it to get it off the guy's face and it flies away. Uh, so cool. Mm hmm. That was cool. And yeah, I like that um, Osha, first of all, we learn about her that she does seem like a lawful character because she says she has faith in the Jedi and the aliens are like, ha ha ha, enjoy prison. Um, but I also like, and this is after a contrast with another show later in the timeline that we've talked about recently that I know you had some trouble with this fact, John. It's nice to see a character struggle with the Force. <laughs> I, I agree with that. I think this is someone who clearly has an ability in the Force but has lost touch with it. And I like mm -hmm. that kind of story. I think we see that in some of the video games. Right. Right, that's true. Especially the Jedi games, yeah. Um, mm hmm yeah, but we see she can't use the force to grab Pip. She's trying. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we know she's somehow severed. Um, I guess we'll find out how and why and what. But and then eventually the ship rolls her way. So she gets Pip and gets her out. And uh, they land on this planet called Karlak, which is a location from the Clone Wars where a certain group will eventually be based called Death Watch. Mm, good catch. We talked about the Vizlas when talking about the Mandalorian in previous episodes, and it, that's during the era of pre Vizsla. Um, and Karlak is also mentioned in the High Republic books. So nice. We also talked about another concept in the Old Republic episodes um, that comes up later in the timeline as well. Do you think that they're telling us Osha and May are a Force dyad? Good question. I. So I, before we had confirmation that May was actually physically alive, mm -hmm. for a minute, I thought maybe that Osha was dissociating and becoming mm -hmm. May, like sleep killing Jedi. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Like, like she had and she was so dissociating that she pictured this other version of herself as her dead twin sister. Right. And then I was like, nah, she's just actually alive. That's 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 fine. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, evil twin story. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But I, maybe the question will be like, who is evil, or probably neither of them, to be honest. Right. Right. They all. They all have things to learn. Let's say. But it's interesting if the Sith are involved in this story. Then we know uh, from we know from lore throughout the the Star Wars is that um, the Sith, the rule of two, was in part an attempt to force a force dyad. 
So if they find, and if May has something to do with the Sith and they find out she has a force dyad that could make them want to use her as a certain, as a puppet in a certain way. Mm. Um, by the way, I liked that the, the young versions of, uh, were played by real twins, Leah and Lauren Brady, which I could, I clocked right away because I'm like real identical twins aren't actually carbon copies of each other. <laughs> Right, right. That for you sure. can tell them apart, but it makes sense, you know, to use Amon Stenberg in two roles. I'm not uh, against that at all. <laughs> I mean, don't tell like every sitcom ever that twins are not completely identical because then that'll ruin all these things like Sister Sister. Right. You ever watch that one? I used to watch that. Oh, yeah. I used to love that. Yeah. 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 My sister and I used to watch it. Get it? <laughs> 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 we did for real. Um, but I love, yeah, speaking of the sister bond, I, I, this poem, this creepy poem. So they say, you're with me, I'm with you, always one, but born is two. As above sits the stars, and below lies the seas. I give you you, and you give me me. And then at the end of the poem, the vision of May's character's eyes turn black. Spooky. That does feel very much like forced... Like, like this feels like someone else is orchestrating this almost. Mm. Maybe someone's already manipulating the Force Dyad. Although May doesn't didn't doesn't seem to know in the next episode that her sister's alive. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but I I wonder if it's just a you know one way street over here for yeah. now. Well, it's also it's interesting. Um, so new rock stars pointed out that the way the little girls say this is they're sharing the last lines back and forth. And so the way they say it is both times May saying, um, I give you you and Osha saying, you give me me. So it's only May giving Osha Osha. Mm. I, that could mean nothing, but I, I thought it was an interesting point that uh, that noticed. is interesting. So meanwhile, Saul's current Padawan, Jackie Lon, played by Daphne Keene, as we talked about, collects her master to bring him to the detainment level to interrogate the prison ship escapees who have already been recaptured. They claim Osha started it all until Saul mind tricks them into telling him the real story. Finestra says that still doesn't clear Osha's separate murder charges, but Finestra assumes Osha died in the crash. She sent probe droids to check, but Saul is sure she's still alive and he wants to go get her himself. He brings Jackie and Yord. Jackie has a lot of questions about Osha, and Saul explains that he was stationed on the planet Brendock 16 years ago, and he says it was May who started the fire in Osha's visions, a fire that killed their entire family and village. Jackie and Yord are surprised to learn Osha has a twin because May is not listed in the Jedi records. Jackie asks if May could be the real killer, but Saul is sure he saw May die. When the Jedi ship shows up, Osha runs, eventually cornered on a cliff where she almost falls before Saul catches her with the Force. When she tells him she knows May is alive, Saul believes her and believes her innocence. They all leave together. Mm. So just have to call out that uh, the ship, by the way, that they arrived on uh, at the when they showed up at the Nemoidian ship is a Jedi vector. And so Jedi starfighters during uh, the High Republic era they had a weapon system requirements that they you had to use a lightsaber as a key so no one but a Jedi could unlock them. Um, huh. I'm again, I'm not like a ship aficionado. So uh, again, if people have more expertise in that, that's like a whole thing on its own. <laughs> so right. I'd love to hear other people's breakdowns of that. And cool. of course, we get a we get a reference to Jedi mind tricks. We don't which only work on the weak minded, which I think applies mm-hmm. to these prisoners. I, lo- I love soul doing that quiet your mind. And and it's so casual. Yeah. It feels very in line with the original Jedi mind tricks we saw. Right. Right. Very. Which was again, well, no, now I'm thinking of Qui-Gon, but uh, that's not the original we saw. <laughs> right. Right. We do learn from the High Republic comics that the Jedi temple has a detention center with Sith containment cells. And this is like a multi-level high security prison uh, in the temple in Coruscant. It was built centuries before this to, to detain the Sith and their allies. And so it's a massive complex, um, but it's also specially designed to hold force wielders. So if we see a force wielder there, it's going to be difficult for them to get out because um, they used cortosis reinforced dura mm. crete. <laughs> 
um, in rare force resistant alloys. And so cortosis is it's kind of like the vibranium of Star Wars in that it's super durable. Once it's processed, it's really flaky when you first mine it. But once it's processed, it has special properties that it absorbs and uh, diffuses energy, basically. So it will dissipate the an, a blaster bolt on contact, for example, and it can even short out a Jedi's lifesaver. But it can be overcharged, so it's not you know it's not it's not uh, endless. There's ways to get around it. But just uh, just saying, if we find people back here, then um, that's what we're dealing with. Right. Um, hmm. We've got more hiding of Jedi records going on. We've got Jackie again, who's a uh, Thelan human hybrid. We talked about that a lot in the uh, Acolyte prep episode. And of course, we've got the, we also talked about the two types of robes, the golden and white temple formal robes. Like you see Yord when he goes to talk to the, to the Nemoidians, that's like an official visit. So he's in white. But then when Sol and the others are going out on missions. They wear brown robes over that because that's their mission robes. Yeah, that's cool. And I, 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 I you know, I'm a sucker for a Jedi throwing off a an outer robe mm-hmm. to fight harder. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. We also get um, we get some yeah some extra fashion for the High Republic. <laughs> like I love those belts that they have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Padawans, they get a pop of color. So you'll see Jackie has like a green obi behind her belt because she has a green lightsaber. They're all about accessorizing. Yes. Yeah. They had, I guess, with the time of peace, they had more time to put together their looks. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I wonder, I wonder if they have like a, a hollow deck. You know, they go to the fashion store. They're like, there's like actual Jedi fashion stores. They're like, all right, let's look at the hollow deck. Here's what you would look like with these earrings and, you know, all that. Right. Yeah, there should be. Or like Clueless uh, had that, uh, <laughs> where she has a computer <laughs> and puts herself in all the outfits. But speaking of, so we have hollow picks and Saul's looking at one of Osha and Jackie's like, why are you creeping on your former Padawan? Um, this encourages sentimentality and nostalgia, which lead to attachment. And Saul's like, listen, past memories can serve as lessons. And if they don't meditate on the past, they're doomed to repeat their mistakes. And um, Jackie finishes this last sentence. so. I'm mm-hmm. guessing they've had this this conversation before, but I do notice with her throughout this, like she's more relaxed when Saul's not around. And when Saul walks in the room, she's immediately like, look how serious and good I am. Yeah, I I see both sides of this because. And, and also, I, I'm disturbed by the idea of repeating mistakes. Like, does he does Saul know something about what happened on May's home planet? Yeah, that that may knows, but um, Osha does not. But uh, but right. I do wonder. He seems less guilt ridden than the other three Jedi on May's list. Right. What if they knew something and he didn't? But did you notice Jackie? She's not thrilled about Yord coming, and she's constantly giving Yord cheek, which is delightful, actually. But um, it's kind of funny because they seem similar in some ways. You know, they both seem like we are rule followers, and of course, this is. This is the scene where we get that uh, shirtless scene that the entire internet's going crazy over. Oh my god! <laughs> Sexy Whatever. Star Wars give, incoming. Give them the give them the eye candy. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. We can handle it. Um, I think yeah. There's good. There, it, there's going to be like the old axiom: if evil, why hot? May apply. I'm sorry. I don't mean your horde. I don't mean to like paint your guy in a bad light. I'm suspicious of everyone, but maybe especially him. I'm fine with painting him in a bad light. I'm I you know, he could be good. He could just be annoying. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm I'm suspicious for sure. Cause he's he's just too attached to the rules. Mm-hmm. And that feels like someone who has something to hide. Yeah. And he's very trigger happy throughout this. Um and like mm-hmm. Vanestra, he's sure Osha must have died in the crash, which I, I think the reason she didn't is because the ship skids when it lands. So that definitely saved her. It is interesting that Vanestra sends probe droids, which is something we associate with uh, with the quote-unquote bad guys using later in the timeline. Mm, yeah. 
But the episode ends with May, who meets with someone along the water, someone dressed all in black with a black cape, a mask painted with a chilling smile and wielding a red lightsaber. And as May approaches this person, they say, the Jedi live in a dream, a dream they believe everyone shares. If you attack a Jedi with a weapon, you will fail. Steel or laser are no threat to them, but an acolyte. An acolyte kills without a weapon. An acolyte kills the dream. So, yeah, very Sith post rule of two. Let's like, let's, yeah, let's expose the corruption and. uh, Right, right. From within. Um, But I have a feeling for May, it's at least as much about personal revenge as of killing the dream. And that might be a conflict for her going forward. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, I think that's right. I think she, it says in the intro, right? In the opening crawl, like she's risking exposure. Right. So this does seem to be against the mission of her order. Right. Yeah. And um, May so far is obviously she's, uh, she's failed to kill without using a weapon. But the major thing that everyone's talking about going out of this is who is inside that helmet. Uh, we've got a voice distorter, so it could really be anyone. It doesn't have to be a man. I've heard theories that it could be there's prominent Siths, uh, Tenebris and Plagueis, which we talked about in the previous uh, in the preview episode. Could be Chimir, uh, one of the witches that we saw in the trailers, or it, it, so I've even seen Indara herself uh, suggested, um, no. or Yord, or uh, how interesting would it be if it were Venestra? It's not likely, and I think people would get upset, but it would be interesting just to see. Yeah, that that feels too cheap for me. I, I mean, hope not. So we see May. She's got a purple cloak, which is known for, you know, it combines the red and the blue. It's kind of showing maybe a moral ambiguity. And Venestra also wields a purple saber. And there is something from Legends lore that says that purple sabers, like the one that um, that uh, Mace Windu has later in the timeline, that mm-hmm. they are purple because it's someone is able to kind of wield the light side and the dark side in balance at the, in the same time. Um, so Venestra's her lightsaber, which we'll definitely see in action. It's light purple, but I don't know, just, just calling attention to it just in case there's mm-hmm. something there, because we're definitely sh- seeing from, we even see from her at her younger age that she will break the rules if she thinks it's for the best. And there's a certain absolutism in her. So I'm, I'm wary of her as well right now, even though she's a hero earlier on. Yeah, I I am I'm suspicious of everybody. I think you're right. I think that's the right call. Yeah. And uh, I have to point out Mobius on our Discord said the look of the helmet reminds me of Abeloth, which is I think Abeloth is like the Mephisto of modern Star Wars. We talk about her in the um we talk about her in the Dawn of the Jedi episode if for anyone who's curious, but just saying it could be I think Abeloth it's going to come into effect later in the timeline, like she does in the Legends books. But just putting it out there, it's not a bad call. Right. Yeah, that's that's a cool poll. Yeah. I like it. I'm I'm very curious to find out who this person is. Yeah, definitely. Aren't we all? So say we all. <laughs> it's actually Merrick. It's just, uh, you know, a, a cloud of dark side. Right. Cloud of shadow. <laughs> Yeah, that's, oh, is that, I made is that, that is that too much? <laughs> no, I yeah, I made a joke about Merrick in the the preview episode. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so John and I just had a little conference uh, off air, and since we <laughs> since we are going so long, there's so much to break down in this first double episode. What we're actually going to do is we're going to pause here for now. And uh, we're just going to release this on its own as the episode one breakdown. And tomorrow we will gather back t- and, and uh, do episode two and release that then separately. So just for this first week. So guess what? You get two episodes this week. Yay. What a day. What a day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's so what, w- six podcasts on the main feed now? Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So we're we're going to, for now, we're going to skip over all of the outro stuff, save that for tomorrow's episode. Um, just there's a link in the show notes to all of the other podcasts that we're going to tell you more about tomorrow and to uh, the Discord and the Patreon and Supercasts and all that fun stuff. 
And we, as always, deeply appreciate our Discord server boosters and our lore masters. We promise we will thank you individually tomorrow. All right. Anything to add for episode one before we skedaddle for now? This got me so hyped for the season and I'm so excited for it. I can't believe people are review bombing because boy, is this a good series and you're missing out if you're not watching it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you haven't watched yet, you have time to catch up before our next episode. So we don't spoil too. (laughs) Yep. Yep. All right. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. The Lorehounds podcast is produced and published by The Lorehounds. You can send questions and feedback and voicemails at thelorehounds.com slash contact. Get early and ad-free access to all Lorehounds podcasts at patreon.com slash the Lorehounds. And connect with us on Twitter at The Lorehounds. Any opinions stated are ours personally and do not reflect the opinion of or belong to any employers or other entities. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.